In this video, you'll learn how to use virtual machines for free with VirtualBox and take your cyber skills to the next level. Have you ever been so frustrated with your operating system crashing or becoming slow over time? Because I certainly have. Before virtual machines or VMs, I did all of my web browsing, work, and entertainment right on the native OS. But not anymore, because over time, your computer gets bogged down with temporary files, plugins, and maybe even malware from long-term use. You end up wiping the disk and reinstalling. Or maybe you even just buy a nuke box. With VMs though, my computer just doesn't slow down over time because I can segregate everything within a virtualized OS under my full control and reset it in seconds. Today, I'm gonna show how you can do this as well and supercharge your personal digital security. We'll go over building an Ubuntu Linux and Windows 10 VM in VirtualBox so you're fully equipped for both environments. Stay tuned. Before we start, let's go over VMs conceptually. So VMs are simply collections of files on your computer that software called a hypervisor can read and run. For the most part, the native or host operating system runs idle and doesn't use the excess CPU cores, RAM, or storage space physically present on your computer. The hypervisor can grab what's unused and create a pool of resources to allocate for a virtual or guest operating system. With all that said, let's get set up. To begin, we'll need to download the hypervisor and installation media. Let me open up a web browser and navigate to virtualbox.org. Click the download button and pick the right installer for your host operating system. We'll save that to the desktop. I'm also gonna verify the SHA-256 hash of the installer by opening up bash and running the SHA-256 command. I'll copy the hash and search for it in the list with control F and that checks out. Next, I'm gonna to go to ubuntu.com, download, and pick 1804 LTS. LTS stands for long-term support and represents the newest stable release available. We'll save the ISO somewhere, which is just a CD image. I'll click the verify link to get a one line bash command to do the checksum as well. And we have an okay. To download Windows 10, search Windows Media Creation Tool. Go to Microsoft's webpage, download it, and run the installer. Let me accept the license agreement to proceed. When it asks what you want to do, select Create Installation Media for another PC, choose ISO file, and save it somewhere. Before installing, you'll want to make sure that your computer's UEFI or BIOS has the virtualization features for your CPU turned on. You'll see the terms VTD and VTX or AMDV depending on if you're running an Intel or AMD processor. On Mac OS, these settings should be enabled already. On Linux, you'll have to quickly hit enter, F12, F2, delete, or some other key after reboot and seeing the power on self-test or post screen. On Windows 10, search Change Advanced Startup Options in the taskbar and click Restart Now under Advanced Startup. Click Troubleshoot, Advanced Options, UFI Firmware Settings, and Restart to get to the BIOS settings. So now we'll run through the VirtualBox installer. Once that's finished, let's build an Ubuntu VM first. I'll click New to make a new virtual machine. We'll name it Ubuntu 18.04 and use a default location for saving our VMs. For memory size, you'll typically want to use something that's enough for the OS you're installing and applications you'll be running. We'll use this VM for just development and web browsing, so I'll give it 3 gigs. A virtual hard disk is a file that can be mounted just like a physical drive and is where the hypervisor installs your OS. Different hypervisors have different file formats for virtual hard disks as you can see here. If you're just going to use this VM for VirtualBox, go ahead and choose VDI. VHD is used by Microsoft Hyper-V and VMDK is used by VMware. If you ever want to import this VM for use on a different hypervisor, choose one of the others. You can always use a tool to convert between them. I'm gonna pick VMDK for now so I can easily import into VMware down the road. Dynamically allocated disks take up just what's actually used, which is usually less than what you allocate. If the Ubuntu installation takes up 8 gigs, but we made a 64 gig dynamically allocated virtual disk, the actual file in your host OS will only be around 8 gigs. A fixed 64 gigs will eat up the entire amount of space on your drive. 
I almost always use dynamic disks since they're more portable and resizable. If you're running applications with lots of reads and writes like a mail or database server, Fixed will give you better performance and less fragmentation over time. We don't need to split the VM into smaller chunks since modern drives support files hundreds of gigs in size. I'm going to give this VM 10 gigs, which is more than enough to fit Ubuntu and most apps you might install. If you need to store lots of files, we can just create a bigger virtual disk in the VM and mount it to use specifically for storage later. With the VM built, I'm going to attach our Ubuntu ISO to the VM's virtual CD drive by going to Settings, Storage, IDE Controller, and adding the ISO. Let me run you through some of the other VM settings real quick. In general, we can go to Advanced and enable one-way or two-way copy-paste and drag and drop. In Disk Encryption, you can set a password to encrypt the VM. Under System, we can change the boot order and adjust the amount of resources dedicated to the VM. I'm going to bump up the CPU cores to two. I also go to Display and double the available memory. Audio lets you pass through your host OS's sound driver. Under Network, we can change how this VM connects to the internet. With NAT, VirtualBox will act like a router and forward the VM's traffic so it appears to originate from your host operating system. With Bridged Adapter, VirtualBox will act like a switch and pass your VM's traffic through to the host computer's physical network interface with its own MAC address. It's as if the VM was just another physical computer on the network you're connected to. If you want other computers on the network to see and communicate directly with your VM without port forwarding, use Bridged. Internal Network lets you build a private network between multiple VMs you're running, so you can make a virtualized home lab to play around with. This network can't talk to the host computer or outside world, though. Host Only is similar to Internal Network, except the guests can talk to the host computer. Net network is like private network, except the VMs can talk to the internet. Not attached isolates your VM from any network connectivity. Shared folders let you choose a directory on your host OS to mount inside of your VM. This is one way to transfer files between the host and guest OSs. Now malware that can escape your VM do exist, though they're quite rare. Most of them exploit the shared folders, clipboard, and drag and drop functions in hypervisors. So remember to disable these features when you're not using them. Now that you're familiar with the settings, let's install Ubuntu Linux now. Hit Start to boot up the VM. I'm going to scale up the windows so we can see things easier. At launch, it'll prompt us with running through the installation process. I'm going to do a minimal install to keep everything lean. We'll skip doing special partitioning setups like LVM and just let it use the default. Pick a time zone you're in and set the login and hostname information. Then wait for the install to complete. Once that's done, click Restart, and make sure the installation ISO is unchecked, meaning ejected, from the virtual CD drive, so it can boot from the virtual hard drive. Let me run through the What's New screen real quick. The next thing you want to do is install VirtualBox's guest editions by mounting it as a CD in the VM. This installs drivers that make everything run smoother and at a better resolution. Ubuntu doesn't come with some development packages that you need to install guest editions, so we'll open up a terminal and type the following command to make them. We'll need GCC, make, Perl, DKMS, and the build essential packages. Once that's done, open the CD, run the software, and wait for it to complete. Press enter and then reboot the system. Once it's back up, we can rescale the screen to a better resolution, and you'll notice much more responsive interaction now. You should take a snapshot at this point so you have a clean installation state. Go to Machine, Snapshot, and give it a name. Now you're ready to use a VM like a normal operating system. If I want to transfer files between the host and guest without drag and drop or shared folders, VirtualBox also lets me create a session by going to Machine, File Manager, and providing a username and password to the VM. I can go to my home desktop folders and transfer files back and forth. I'll copy the media creation tool we downloaded earlier. As you can see, it's now in the VM. 
Let me show you snapshots in action now. Let's say I go to wallstreetjournal.com and get a bunch of tracking cookies. While I could try to clear them out in the browser, it's not a perfect sanitization. I'll take a snapshot of the current state, then power off the VM, go back to my snapshot library, and restore to the first one, then click Start. Bam, back in time. Now, I'm gonna show you what your Ubuntu VM actually looks like on the host OS, with Ubuntu taking up around six gigs and an XML file defining the settings for the VM, a folder for our saved snapshots, and one for our logs. You can easily zip up this folder for backup and send it to a friend to share. We did it with Linux, now let's make a Windows VM. I'm gonna run through very similar settings, just with higher resource allocations. In settings, I'll now attach our Windows ISO to the virtual CD drive. I'll bump up the CPU cores as well. Let's start the VM and go through the installation process. Once you're at the activation step, enter a license key if you have one. If you don't have one, click I don't have a product key to use with some cosmetic restrictions. What you shouldn't do is torrent some cracked or bootleg version of Windows to use for free perpetually. You're almost guaranteed to get bonus features that enroll your computer in a botnet controlled by some crime group to mine cryptocurrency or attack other computers. As the saying goes, if you don't pay for the product, it's probably because you are the product. I'm gonna pick Windows 10 Pro in, which is for European customers and doesn't come with pre-installed media technologies like Skype, music, video, and voice recorder. Let's move on to a custom install of Windows and partition this virtual drive. While we're waiting, let me show you how VMs can help you achieve two important security principles, compartmentalization and ephemerality. Compartmentalization is purposely separating things from each other so that damage to some have limited effect on the whole. If you imagine watertight compartments on a ship, flooding only a few compartments doesn't make the entire ship sink. Same thing with a bank vault. Once you've gotten through the big door, there's hundreds of smaller deposit boxes inside. There's really no way to pick through all of them in time before the cops come, which limits the amount of money you can steal. When it comes to virtual machines, software and data are contained, so application crashes and lockups are isolated from your host OS and other VMs you're running. Same is true of malware infections, so much that security researchers will use VMs for reverse engineering and conducting forensics. The second principle, ephemerality, means changes to your state are temporary. In the popular game Overwatch, the character called Tracer can rewind herself seconds back to a previous location to reverse damage and avoid imminent danger. With VMs and snapshots, we've got the same advantage. Ephemerality gives you the luxury of taking on greater risks since the costs of doing so are cheap. Now, if your host OS is already compromised, VMs aren't gonna help you very much. It's best to start using them from a fresh host that you fully trust is clean. Once Windows is done installing, we'll make sure it's ejected like last time by going to Devices, Optical Drives, and Ejecting. After the reboot, step through the welcome screen. Now, just like last time, we'll install the VirtualBox Guest Editions drivers in this VM. On Windows, it's a bit more straightforward of an install. After it's finished, reboot and log in. Now we can make the display larger from within Windows and make things easier to see. I'll do a fresh install snapshot and we are good to go. As you can see, Using VMs with VirtualBox makes it incredibly flexible to start learning cybersecurity. It gives you exposure to different software and operating systems, lets you build virtual networks to study networking protocols and establish a development environment for programming and coding. So what are the cons of using virtual machines? Well, as a start, there's much higher resource requirements for running multiple OSs, since you gotta divide and allocate them in advance. There's a rumor Bill Gates once said that 64 kilobytes of RAM ought to be enough for anyone. I used to think 64 gigabytes of RAM ought to be enough for anyone too. But when you're running lots of virtual machines, there's really no limit to how much you'll need. 
Virtualization also doesn't give you that same snappy feel as the host OS. This is especially true when it comes to graphics intensive activities like desktop animations, games, or videos. At the end of the day, I find that the performance and stability of virtual machines have really improved over the years and work quite nicely for day-to-day -day use. So that's it for VirtualBox and how to build VMs. You've successfully learned how to set up a hypervisor, configure and install an OS, and operate your first virtual machine. If this video was valuable for you, hit that like button, share it with your friends and coworkers, and subscribe today. And before you leave, I wanna know, what kinds of things are you using VMs for? I do almost everything in VMs exclusively for the compartmentalization and security benefits. Thanks so much for watching, and if you have any questions, please let me know. See you soon.